having finished with our discussion here of, of problem number three, the, uh, the difference between WTP and WTA, we can go back to our list of problems with contingent valuation. And the next one is problem number four called the part whole bias. And I think the easiest way to understand this is an example. Here's a list of the Great Lakes in the United States, you know, the eastern and midwestern part of the United States between the US and Canada. Suppose one took a, a random sample of 300 University of Utah undergraduates. And, and you split them up into three, three different groups. And you asked one of them, how much would you be willing and able to pay to clean up Lake Superior? And you asked the second group of, of 100 University of Utah undergraduates, how much would you be willing and able to pay to clean up Lake, uh, Lake Michigan. And you ask the third group, how much would you be willing and able to pay to clean up all the Great Lakes? Here's what you might find. That the first group of 100 University of Utah undergraduates asked, what is your willingness to pay to clean up Lake Superior? I give you a number like, let's say $25 on average. That's the first group. The second group asked, what is your willingness and ability to pay to clean up Lake Michigan? But also, let's say, respond about $25. And then the th third group of University of Utah undergraduates. What are your, what's, what's your willingness and ability to pay to clean up all the Great Lakes? And what you often find is that the answer is something like $25. Now, from an adding up point of view, this doesn't make any sense because there are five Great Lakes. And so you'd think that the WATP to clean up all five is going to be a lot bigger than the WATP to clean up one of them. But this doesn't seem to be typical. And the explanation, so this is called the part whole bias. So the part is just like Superior, or just like Michigan, or just like Huron, or just like Erie, or just like Ontario. And the whole is all of the Great Lakes. And you'd expect that the whole is equal to the sum of the parts. But it turns out that the whole often ends up being much less than the sum of the parts. So that's the part whole bias. Then the question is, why? And the reason seems to be that when, let's say, University of Utah undergraduates, Utah is located very far away from the Great Lakes. Lots of uh, University of Utah undergraduates have never seen the Great Lakes. They're certainly not very familiar with them in the sense of having visited them a lot of times, having taken boats on them, and so forth and so on, that when, when, when a university Utah undergraduate hears a question like, what is your willingness to pay to clean up Lake Superior? Or what is your willingness to pay to clean up the Great Lakes? They don't really have in mind specifically Lake Superior, or in the second question here, Lake Michigan. Instead, what they perceive the question to ask is, how much are you willing to pay to do something good for the environment today? And that's the question that they think about, regardless of whether you ask them about Lake Superior, about Lake Michigan, or about all the Great Lakes. And so if what they're thinking about is, what are you willing to pay to do something good for the environment today? then they're going to give you the same answer because they're thinking of this as being the same question. Not literally the same question, but practically the same question. 
This is called a warm glow. So warm glow means the good feeling that you get after having done something that's good. And the notion is here that you're willing to pay $25 in order to get a warm glow, in order to feel good about having helped out the environment today. And so you're paying the $25 for the warm glow. The details of it aren't very important. And I mean, university town undergraduates know that there's more than one or two Great Lakes, but the details of exactly which Great Lake is where and what it looks like and what what a uh, what kind of land surrounds it is going to be vague for lots of of U of U undergraduates. So this is the explanation of the part whole bias that people aren't really perceiving the parts separately from the whole. So they're just responding to how much you're willing to pay to get a warm glow. Now, if you were to ask the same group of students uh, how much you're willing to pay to clean up Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and all the Great Lakes, in other words, not different groups of students, but the same, you probably aren't going to see the part whole bias because people know that there are more than two Great Lakes. Indeed, if you were to give them a, a, a written question listing every one oops, uh, every one of the lakes and asking what are you willing to pay to clean up Lake Superior? What are you willing to pay to clean up Lake Michigan? Again, here on Erie, Ontario. Um, so if they could see on the written sheet of paper that they were going to be asked separately about each one of the five lakes, you're also probably not going to get the part whole bias. Um, if you ask them about the five lakes and then you ask them about the lakes together, they would probably just, the lakes together, they would probably just add up what they had for the individual lakes. In addition, if you were to ask um, university to undergraduates, how much are you willing to pay to clean up Utah Lake? How much are you willing to pay to clean up the Jordan River? And then how much are you willing to clean up both Utah Lake and the Jordan River? Let me write those down. So Utah Lake. Jordan River. Here you are unlikely to observe a part whole bias because University of Utah undergraduates, many of them at least, are quite familiar with Utah Lake and the Jordan River. So when you ask them what are you willing to pay to clean up Utah Lake, they don't interpret that as what are you willing to pay to get a warm glow, to do something good for the environment. Instead, they're thinking specifically about Utah Lake in all the details that they're aware of. And then when you ask them about the Jordan River, they're thinking about the Jordan River and all of its details. So these are very concrete, well understood environmental amenities in in their mind and you're not going to observe a part whole bias in general. So to get a part whole bias, the question needs to be a little bit vague in the minds of the people that are answering the survey. Now, what do you do as an economist if you have a part whole bias? Well, probably it might be a good idea to something like to do something like showing the respondents all the different all the different parts that you're going to ask about. I mean, that's that's one thing you could do. Or you could try to educate them more about the particulars of, let's say, with the Great Lakes, the individual lakes. We'll, we'll talk about that more when we get to, um, to problems seven and eight. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's problem number four, the part whole bias. And then let me talk about problem number five. Um, problem number five is called vehicle bias, but this doesn't mean motor vehicle. It means the method by which if WTP or WTA is going to be collected, how it's going to be collected. So for example, um, you could say, how much are you willing to pay to save Yellowstone National Park? And in one situation, you say that if the government decides to save Yellowstone National Park, it's going to impose a tax on the people who wanted to save it. And in the other situation, you say, 
if the government decides to save Yellowstone National Park, it's going to increase the entry fee. And so people who visit the park are going to have to pay more. Now, in theory, the question, how much are you willing to pay to save Yellowstone, should result in exactly the same answer regardless of how the government is going to collect the money from you. Uh, let's suppose that the amount of tax the amount that taxes would increase would be the same as the amount of money that you'd pay in extra in extra uh, entry fees to Yellowstone every year. So the money would be the same. The thing is that some people don't like, for example, taxes. So whenever they hear the word taxes, they say, no, I don't want any taxes. The name vehicle, the word vehicle here means the method by which government collects the money. So if there's some people who don't like taxes, but don't have any real objection to entry fees, then if you say that, if you ask a WTA or WTP question, and they know that taxes are involved or potentially involved, they're liable to give you smaller answers for their, let's say, WATP. Whereas if entry fees are involved and they don't object to entry fees, then they're liable to give you larger answers. So the way or the vehicle by which the government uses to collect the money is actually affecting how much money people say they're willing to, and able to pay for the amenity. Now, that's not supposed to be the case. It, it, the, the standard economic theory says that if I take $20 away from you, it doesn't matter how I take the $20 away from you. What's important is that I took the $20 away from you. I mean, how presumably I'm not hurting you physically or anything like that or scaring you. Um, but it's a $20 that matters. It's not whether I took it from you by increasing your taxes or by increasing an entry fee. But to the extent that people don't agree with that, to the extent that people think that $20 taken away from them through taxes feels very differently than $20 taken away from them via an entrance fee, then you're going to get this, this at, le at least potentially, you're going to get vehicle bias. How do you fix it? Well, you know, you could recruit twice as many people to answer your survey and tell half of them that you're going to be collecting it via, via taxes and half of them that you're going to collect it via an entry fee and and see if there's a difference and if there is a difference on average between these two groups and there's no reason to think that anything else would affect their answer then you can attribute the difference to the vehicle bias and then you could and then you could adjust for it um, in this video i want to talk about one more problem and um, the, the rest will we'll take care of in the next video this is problem number six starting point bias so it's pretty common in the continued evaluation survey to do it with multiple choice questions. So let's suppose the question is, how much are you willing to pay to clean up Salt Lake City air quality? And first suppose that these are the choices that are given to the respondents. You know, a, a, they should answer either A, B, C, D, or E. So A is less than $10, B is between 10 and 20, and so forth. C is 20 and 30, D is 30 and 40, E is more than 40. And you collect those, those answers. And fairly often, of course not always, but fairly often what you'll see is that, uh, that more people answer the, give an answer in the middle than in the extremes. So suppose you you recruited 200 students and you gave 100 of those students this survey. The other 100 students got the same question, but these as the possible answers. So again, how much are you willing to pay to clean up the air in Salt Lake? A, less than 30, B, 30 to 50, C, 50 to 70, D, 70 to 90, E, more than 90. Now, totally rational people would you know, pick a number for their willingness to pay, let's say 20, or let's say 22. And then they'd be consistent. So if they were given the left-hand choices, uh, 22 would be in C, and if they were given the right-hand choices, 22 would be in A, in A. But it turns out that given this 
second survey, again, what you end up seeing is a whole lot of people picking the middle choice. And so on average, you get higher reported WATPs or WTAs, if that's what you're asking. You, you get higher reported, um, higher valuations if people get the right-hand survey than if people get the left-hand survey. And so you see why it's called starting point bias. Where you start from on the left-hand one is less than 10, and then the right-hand one is less than 30. Now, one problem to one way to certainly avoid starting point bias is, is not to ask multiple choice questions. Ask fill in the blank. What is your willingness to pay to clean up the air quality in Salt Lake City? Just tell me a number. But it's a lot easier to to code responses of multiple choice questions because you can have a computer do that. Whereas if it's fill in the blank, then the survey taker has to, to write something down, and uh, if and often that needs to be then uh, somebody else needs to code it so that a computer can read it and a computer can do the tabulation. So it's a lot easier to, to it's it's a lot less expensive to run a survey if you're doing multiple choice things than if you're doing uh, fill in the blank free response. But but multiple choice is is subject to this, at least potentially, to the starting point bias. Okay, um, that's that's all I think for uh, for this video. In the next video, we'll we'll go on to problem number seven.